Okay, guys, I think we have to start because it's the time to start with even our the little participants because we have no patience usually, yeah, <laughs> to listen very long. And um, let's go deep again into artificial intelligence topic, our main topic. And our subtopic is now the framework convention on AI and human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. And I want to invite Thomas Schneider, who is the moderator of this panelist. Tommy, please. And present the panelists. Oh, I made a mistake. Let, let's give us uh, two more minutes because they are not there yet. They're oh, God. Okay. <laughs> so, let's wait. so, you are still drinking coffee? Whatever they do, they are not. Oh, we decided to explore yeah. Vilnius during the storm. Because <laughs> it's better to stay here. It was, I don't know if you know, guys, but um, in the afternoon, we are expecting a really heavy storm at around three or, or four, so at the beginning of the, all the events. So have this in mind, and you know, since yesterday, we are receiving notification that we need to take care of ourselves, of our things, because today, really a huge storm is coming with ice falling down from the clouds and so on. So we have this in mind and don't plan exploring Vilnius in the afternoon because it's better to stay somewhere that has the roof and you. Okay. So we are waiting for a minute or two uh, because the online participant. Okay, so. <coughs> Unfortunately, the gender balance is not is not really optimal. We uh, were to have a, a lady from Meta, but she felt sick, so uh, uh, so she cancelled uh, yesterday. Unfortunately, so um, yeah. Um, well, welcome to this uh, second session uh, this morning on, on topic three um, on AI. <coughs> and this is mainly but not only focusing on, on 
one of the key instruments of these thousands of instruments that we'll see, uh, we're seeing and will uh, continue to see in the future, it's of course the Convention of the Council of Europe. We've had our uh, uh, the Secretary General Maria Pecinovic Buric uh, talk about it, and, and, and me as well in the in the previous the previous round. Um, so uh, it has been uh, adopted by the uh, Committee of Ministers on 17th of May. And as we've heard, it will be open for signature in September. Um, we hope that uh, it's quite a, it's quite a, an intense timeline. Like we, in the Kai, we've been used to intense timelines, but that's life. Uh, <laughs> things get faster. So we'll hope that, yeah, uh, at least some countries will be ready to, to sign it uh, in, in, in September. And we do have uh, two people here that were participants uh, in, in, the, um, <coughs> in, the, in the negotiations. Uh, uh, from uh, representing governments uh, from different ministries and, and, of course, from different continents, uh, as Canada is not yet part of, of Europe um, formally. So, um, <laughs> yeah, we, we should let you in, into the Eurovision Song Contest uh, thing either. Yeah, that's uh, last night proof that there's talent. Uh, so that's definitely something to, to think about. Um, yeah. But uh, again, of course, it is important uh, that to note that the, uh, and that's what, what the, the Secretary General uh, has said, there were big discussions during the negotiations on whether we should uh, have a, a European convention that would be much more based on and oriented and using the European instruments that we have, of course, mainly the European Convention on Human Rights and, and the court and everything that, that is based on this, versus trying to go uh, global, trying to develop an instrument that is attractive to also non-European countries. And of course, there are pros and cons, and there were hard fights, and people were criticizing me in the media, for instance, to be too, too uh, inviting uh, non-European countries, but, but I was uh, convinced, and so was the Secretariat, that it is important to try and uh, develop something that may have a global reach, given that um, most of the AI systems are developed in countries that are not part of the European Union or not even part of Europe. And we do have uh, shared values, but different ways in, in, in implementing them. So I'm very happy, again, to have uh, two people from different two different continents here. So. Um, let me turn to our first uh, panelist, uh, my dear friend uh, Mario from Spain. Um, you're a law professor, so he knows actually uh, the legal part much better than I do, and he was very useful in this uh, during the negotiations uh, in Madrid. And he was the head of the delegation of Spain in the, uh, in the negotiations and a member of the bureau as well. Uh, very constructive uh, support. Thanks for this again. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, what, what are your, your takeaways? Um, what, did you, what did you learn? How, how, to what extent were your expectations fulfilled uh, with this convention? How do you see it in the, in the bigger landscape of, of and you, I know that you also were in Latin America a number of times talking to, to people from, from that continent because you speak Italian so well, of course, um, that helps. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, what are your takeaways? What did you learn and what do we how, What is coming in the future? Thank you. Okay. Good morning, can you hear me? Yeah, <coughs> so first of all, Thomas, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Hello, Thomas, dear Thomas. Um, I would like to say um, my first words, just to thank you once again, Thomas, because you were in charge of the CAI and you made a very good job because believe me that the guy was a very, very challenging, uh, uh, <laughs> very, very challenging everything, very, very challenging uh, task. Um, and I did believe that we couldn't make it because the, 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 the time were very tight, the, the, the complex things are, were very, very like challenging and you did a very <coughs> terrific job. And thanks to the Secretariat also with Christian, Vadim and Luis because they did a very good job. So they were the, the best people. And in the end, you succeeded. You drove us to the end in this uh, very happy ending. Um, the Frame of Convention, I think, is very good news. Uh, if you see also along with the European Union regulation on AI, on AI, AI Act, because um, these two instruments are complementary. And this is a very important idea, and you were very keen on having other countries uh, out of Europe 
because uh, we have different perspectives, different legal uh, backgrounds, but the AI is so common. The challenges are very common. So uh, you had from the very beginning like a very clear idea that only European countries couldn't make uh, general standards. So we need to be there also, Canada for sure, United States, Japan, Israel, other countries, Latin American countries. So the first idea I would like to uh, highlight is that these two European instruments are complementary. And, uh, and that's are good news because without the uh, European Union regulation on AI, <coughs> there was no framework convention of Council of Europe. Both instruments, we need to, uh, to take uh, them uh, together. And my second idea I would like to uh, highlight is regarding democracy. Because I'm a constitutional lawyer, so I was very worried about the democracy challenges regarding artificial intelligence. Because the um, uh, European Union regulation was very focused on, well, not very focused, but the main concern was fundamental rights, but not about democracy or rule of law. And democracy is one of the main topics uh, regarding uh, Council of Europe. And we were working very hard from the very beginning in the CAHAI about democracy. And uh, it was not very easy to try to regulate through a legally binding instrument a very complex institution as democracy. And by complex, I mean not difficult one, by an institution composed by many institutions, principles, fundamental rights, processes. And as a matter of as fact, we have to be clear that artificial intelligence is playing a political role already in, the, in these three elements that we could allocate in this guy regarding democracy, like the confirmation of public opinion, the electoral processes, and the representative institutions. And artificial intelligence is playing an active role in all of those uh, elements. So trying to develop a uh, legal bi legally binding instrument regarding these three institutions was so challenging, so challenging. And from my point of view, we uh, could allocate one fundamental principle to, to face the two main uh, and most problematic characteristic of artificial intelligence regarding democracy, which are autonomous capacity of taking decisions and self-learning which is the individual autonomy principle. So since uh, we are human beings, we need to be considered as an individuals. So we need to, um, to work that the, every human being is treated like a person, like an individual human being, and not like a part of a group, or not to be associated as a part of a profile. This is the main uh, task of this, from my point of view, and from a constitutional lawyer point of view, <coughs> of this framework convention. So individual autonomy is a fundamental principle, which is there in Article 7, also in Article 1, and in the spirit of the whole framework convention. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I'm very happy that you raised, because most of the people are talking about human rights when it comes to AI, also when it comes to the convention, also the convention itself is much more specific on human rights than on democracy. But if you remember the Menti result, actually disinformation, whatever you call it, information integrity was the highest, let's say, concern. And, and we also had uh, lots of discussions and also lots of expectations on, on how to regulate democracy or protect democracy from issues of AI. So I, I hope that that will come up in the discussion because it's actually a very challenging issue. So let me now turn to the... Um, Mr. David Fairchild, um, he is the first Secretary of the Permanent Mission of Canada to the Office of the United Nations in Geneva, uh, and uh, was the uh, Head of Delegation of Canada to the, to the CHI, uh, very outspoken, <laughs> so <laughs> keeping, uh, reminding us about how many hours we have left uh, from the very beginning to the end uh, to, to negotiate that treaty, and um, yeah, how was it for you? Uh, why, why, why is Canada participating at the Council of Europe where you're only so-called observer 
and uh, well, why engage in a cumbersome process with European countries? Good morning. Hi. Good morning, everybody. You can all hear me well. Uh, I do do moonlighting as a backup singer for Thomas at international events, but uh, primarily here to talk about um, the AI treaty. So uh, I guess let me start by thanking, first of all, Thomas, uh, the Council of Europe, for the opportunity. Christian, uh, you're in the, I can see you, but uh, thank you. Um, it was a long two-year journey that's sort of coming to an end, I think, but uh, nevertheless, uh, to your question, I mean, I think Canada was a part of, so prior to the launch of the negotiations, there was another process prior to that, which was more of a, a working group that spent a couple of years studying this question before they launched the negotiations, which Canada was a part of. Um, and I think the reason we were a part of this process is fundamentally, I think we recognized that there was a need, um, either normative, regulatory, or legislative, um, to address the growing issues around AI. And I think one of the challenges, and you've heard this over the last couple of days, is we talk about AI, you know, we go from existential risks of, you know, killer robots and um, Arnold Schwarzenegger breaking through the door at any moment, um, to the very positive benefits that AI are going to deliver. Uh, sitting in Geneva, uh, you have a lot of countries who hear both ends of the spectrum and frankly have nothing to hang anything on. And so there's a real gap. I mean, this tech, emerging technology generally is a, is, an, is a massive gap. And I think there's recognition that there's a gap. And states, regional bodies, at an international level, we are simply attempting to move to try to address some of that. So. Why we wanted to be there was fundamentally this was going to be the first international legal instrument on artificial intelligence. And I think that probably is the key takeaway for, for everybody here. This is the first international legally binding treaty that is going to regulate signatories on AI. And I think that's a very fundamental statement that I think is very important that Canada wants to be a part of. Um, Secondly, and I think this goes to the terms of reference of the whole process, is that they wanted to not offer a completed negotiated text and treaty to the world. They wanted the world to be part of the process. And I think that uh, was both an opportunity and challenge for the Council of Europe and I think also for the European Union, uh, without saying uh, too much on that, simply because they were, they, this question of complementarity versus alignment came up throughout the entire negotiation. And I, I say this with the most humblest of um, statements that as an observer, uh, our job was to ensure that the, the convention itself remained as applicable as possible to the greatest number of states. And that presented some very key challenges in the negotiation by the simple fact that between Europe and other parts of the world, there are some 99% um, symbiosis, but some areas where there are some clear differences. And our job was to challenge the process to ensure that <coughs> that space was left open for, the, for other countries, whether it be Canada or someone else down the road, can find themselves in the treaty. And to understand the treaty is a very slim document it's what we call a framework treaty. And so ultimately, the treaty basically says you need to have a cat to catch mice. They don't care what color the cat is. They don't care if it has a long tail or no tail or long hair or short hair. It has to catch mice. And that's the fundamental of the, fr of the framework treaty. And so the challenge is for the EU, the AI Act is that cat. For other countries, they were at very different stages of development of that framework at the national level. And so, as I quote my UK colleague, we're, normally when you're doing international treaties, you are leveling up national legislation to a higher level at the international level. In this case, most countries didn't have something to start with, and so we were setting the bar. And that was a very difficult challenge in terms of the negotiation because there were some concepts, some ideas, um, you know, whether it be, you know, again, it's, it's a legally binding text. So I think that was one of the, the major challenges. But ultimately, why Canada wanted to be there was to send a strong signal to the world. You know, there are people who are going to respect human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. And there are those who challenge that notion. And so for us, being part of that process and being a signatory, hopeful signatory to this treaty um, is something I think we want to stand by. Thank you very much, David. Um, we um, were supposed, again, to have uh, Laura Galindo from Meta uh, joining us, but unfortunately she fell sick, so she couldn't be here. And uh, then there's another uh, person that was supposed to come, which is David Marti, uh, 
from a, a Swiss from an NGO that was uh, participating also in the, in the negotiations, but he hasn't, which is unusual. Probably he's stuck somewhere in a traffic jam, uh, in a tunnel, in in a, in a Swiss train that is not working, <laughs> because otherwise uh, he would probably be here. The good thing about this is that we have more time to actually have a discussion uh, among among the, the the people here. So I would say let's jump right into the discussion and. Uh, raise your hands online or, or on site, and then, uh, yeah, the floor is open. We thought you were to land the back. Don't end online. Is David online? No. Hello. Hello. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. No, sorry. I I have some thoughts from, I mean, uh, I think the question is, do you think that this approach, this convention, is really balancing innovation and regulation to, I mean, learn from the motto of this year's Euroleague? No, I'm saying this because we also thinking at the previous panel, we had this very long discussion on let's never use AI for migrants because that could, I mean, possibly, I mean, indeed, that, that could uh, lead to, I mean, bias and uh, not appropriate treatment of their rights. And I, I, while I understand this and I support this, I was thinking that in my past experience in Italy, I, I saw migrants that had to wait like 12 months in detention for a judge to be available to judge their application for a refugee status. And so, I mean, maybe technology can also do good things. So maybe, yes, we, we cannot use technology to speed up things. And the result could be, I think, more infringing on the person's human rights than if we had used the technology with all the risk of biases. So the point, in my view, should be not rather, I mean, let's not use these technologies, but how can we use these technologies in a way that uh, preserves the human rights and addresses the inevitable problems and uh, failures of the, the, the technology can, ha can have in some cases. So I, I was wondering whether there was this kind of, of uh, approach, because it's very easy to start to think at a high level, uh, you know, how do we protect everyone's rights, and blah, blah, blah. but the risk is then uh, to never do anything. Thank you. I think let's take a few uh, uh, interventions and then so that we are not always the ones uh, here speaking. So there's somebody online, I understand. Yep. You can go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but no. Go ahead, uh, introduce yourself and go ahead, thank you. Advocate Susanova from South Africa, University of South Africa, um, lecturing in IP, AI, and cyber law, uh, with some stint in international law, in international human rights, have been in the military in South Africa. I'm raising this because I want to place a context of my question. Uh, Prof, thank you from, 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 from Spain in sketching the, the mischief behind the convention. But then my question, having been um, following on the developments, when the, e, the EU AI Act was, was, was actually uh, put in action, the question I asked you was, uh, regarding a clause that is there in the data privacy space, um, which deals with data adequacy, which is critical when one is dealing with the issues as you would know. I'm going to ask the same thing on the convention and further ask the relationship between the convention on AI and the convention that deals with data privacy. And there's a reason I'm asking that. As you might know how the multilateral legal instruments flow, that they would flow and Africa then would then develop an instrument according to which then the, the domestic laws are developed. Having listened to Canada, I would want you to respond in terms of firstly what is the relationship between this convention and the convention that deals with data privacy? Because all of them are dealing with the same thing. The second thing is how do we then see the rollout of the multilateral legal instrument? And what would be the requirements in terms of its enforceability? And I'm asking this being aware of the GDPR and how GDPR is began to 
to actually move beyond the convention in terms of its efficacy, even in Africa, because then you are contracting with the EU. So those are the two questions, but I'm quite excited to be participating in this because I'm also doing a lot of writing and research and supervision in this space of AI and IT. Thank you very much. It's Advocate Zalubo from South Africa. Thank you very much, and this shows also that yeah, how how interconnected we are across the continents. Whatever we do in one part of the world may have consequences in the other. So let's take one more, and then maybe let let the. Uh, you're an Erbgut uh, University, uh, University of Geneva. I've got two two, uh, two short questions. One question uh, concerning Mario. You said. Uh, the A uh, this framework convention wouldn't have been possible without the AI Act. Um, this, that this framework convention wouldn't have been possible without the AI Act. Um, <coughs> many countries, don't, uh, including Switzerland, don't have uh, the AI Act or something similar. And I think, uh, isn't this framework something that comes before, for many countries, before having a concrete act? And the other question is concerning the bias. <coughs> we have often discussed bias as something that is coming with training data that is uh, automatically produced by self-learning systems. And now we are confronted with positive bias. Positive bias, uh, uh, as we can see in Google Gemini, uh, Gemini, where <coughs> we see that the answers are directly biased in a positive way in a, that society likes, but don't, shouldn't we have a right to be free of this positive bias, to have something that is more neutral and not positively biased? So um, <coughs> what, what do you think about this intentional bias that is increasingly being introduced into the systems so those systems are good? But of course, then they are biased. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's let's give a two we colleagues here a chance to reply to. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. So, so kind as usual you are, Mike. Um, starting with the the question about the, that we needed the e European Union regulation to be passed before to pass or to to agree on the framework convention. Um, the, this framework convention um, contains very general principles, very general principles. Uh, not all the countries are, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe non-countries are very happy with the, the end because we wanted to be a little bit more um, ambitious regarding fundamental rights and protection, but uh, we have to give up some pretensions because we understand that for sure most of the countries we don't have, even Spain or normally all the countries, we don't have national regulation on that. So many governments uh, were against uh, of having first uh, um, a law or a legally binding norm, an international one before the, the national one. So they wanted to have a a detailed legally binding law from the national perspective and after that, the international one. But I mean, that is the scenario we had. And we didn't, we, we couldn't have this, uh, we couldn't have this uh, framework convention because for instance, um, we wanted like a um, specific bill of rights regarding artificial intelligence, for instance, right? Uh, that's, we have already those Bill of Rights in all the constitutions, national constitutions, and also in the European Union regulation. Now we have it all to, to be protected. So what I'm trying to say, I'm sorry because I'm <laughs> getting a bit nervous, is like, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I am sometimes because um, uh, the thing is like, uh, in order to have some countries that they wanted to have first, detailing national regulations, the only way to have them on board were to accept very general principles. And these general principles we were very, uh, we, we were uh, agreed on. We have an agreement on that. But some countries didn't want to have a specific regulation because it was very 
difficult to sell them back home. So that it was the only one thing, the only thing, uh, the only way of doing things. Yeah. So sorry. And complementary things, uh, data protection. Of course, this is uh, one of the, the the main topics. How to complement these international instruments and also about data protection. I'm pretty sure that you are almost uh, passing a, a law, I think, on artificial intelligence yeah. and data law. No, thanks, Mario. Um, so I, I guess l there's an interesting counterpoint. So did we need the EU AI Act to have an international convention in a different regional body? No. That would be my short answer. And that was one of the arguments I made quite often in the room. Um, and I, it didn't necessarily please the uh, European Commission, who was negotiating on behalf of the EU. But uh, when you invite non-EU member states to a Council of Europe treaty process, um, my considerations are what's important for Canada. And frankly, a European body of law is not interesting to Canada when I'm signing an international treaty. So there was, this is just a clear example of some areas where there was, no, I wouldn't say conflict, but there was certainly um, some cheeky discourse in the room between friends. Uh, and I think that's part of the, uh, I think, part of the interesting part of this whole process. You know, we had United States, um, Canada, Israel, Japan, Mexico, uh, and then later on a number of uh, South American countries, including Argentina, Colombia, um, Peru, who, who joined the negotiations later on. But what you realized in the throughout this process is that everybody was at different points. And to your answer, and I think the online question is, Canada is not a signatory to 108 plus. We are currently in the process, two years in, trying to pass an updated piece of legislation to address AI and um, data and privacy. Um, there are different opinions about whether we will be successful before we go into an election, but this was a reflection of the problem. Um, you know, the EU could dominate, in a way, the conversations substantively, but there were other countries. You know, the United States does not have legislation. Canada is in the process of developing legislation. And so I think what it resulted in was that we had to focus on the things where we could find agreement. So it was perhaps reductive in that sense, but nevertheless, it was creating a common start point that where all of the entities could agree. Um, and on the question that was raised, innovation was actually one of the very important topics that featured uh, heavily through the negotiations, Vittorio, because I think the question always is going to be is how do you protect rights without, while protecting economic growth and innovation? And so there was a lot of time spent um, trying to figure out how do you regulate um, AI in its development stage, how do you protect R&D? Uh, from regulations while still respecting the need for ethical and rights-based approach. And so um, I think we found, a, hopefully found a landing spot, but often, um, you know, as a diplomat, I would say negotiations aren't about being right. Negotiations are about finding a, a landing spot where everybody can agree. Um, and I think there was a very strong recognition that this was merely a first step, um, but we needed to take it as urgently as possible to try to, try to create an international level leveling up <coughs> that was binding on member states. And I think that's the crucial piece here. Nothing else that you're talking about at the international level, whether it be in the UN or elsewhere, is binding on member states. And so when you, when you sign a treaty, you are taking on legal obligation. Um, and regarding um, innovation, I think there was an endless debate. Um, and there's a kind of contradiction between innovation and protection of human rights. But I think this is a false contradiction because innovation must be done from the protection of human rights. So if you want to make an innovation, you kind of make it trying to destroy the human rights. It's like if you want to innovate about cars um, running through people because you want to show how strong is the metal or whatever. Um, so you need to make the innovation taken into account by default the respect of human rights. Because if you want to make an innovation without taking into account human rights, the outcome will be not a very respectful, of course, with human rights. So uh, from my point of view and from all point of view, it's a false dichotomy. It's not a problem of uh, respecting human rights. It's a way or a certain way of making the innovation. 
And this is the human-centered AI uh, perspective that we do believe in. I'm very happy that, that you say this because you're a law professor. As an economist, I would say we live in capitalist societies where the stronger one, the more agile one wins and gets rich, and the one that is too slow, doesn't find the right uh, services, will, will disappear. And from a legal point of view, you're right, but in, in reality, it's, it's a, it is a tension. There is a tension where you have uh, incentives for people to, if they can't go against human rights, at least, Mm, yeah, go to the limits or just as much beyond as they are not criticized, but it's not supposed to me, uh, me to be talking, so let's go back to the audience and re react. Uh, we have an, an online uh, hand up, so please uh, let us hear what the person is saying. So it's me. Hello, Wolfgang Benedek, University of Graz. Uh, first of all, my congratulations to the speedy conclusion of that uh, convention, which I think is really a great achievement. Uh, my question would um, address uh, some criticism found in the reactions to the convention regarding the implementation. Uh, because uh, the advantage of a framework convention binding uh, compared to the code of ethics of uh, UNESCO is its binding nature. But uh, then regarding the implementation, uh, it seems that uh, states are rather free how to do this, whether uh, by binding laws or also in the form of uh, self-regulation of companies. But uh, if that would be the result, then the question is really what is the value added? Uh, of a binding uh, convention. Thank you. Let's let's take a few more. Uh, David is already starting to breathe. <laughs> Anyone more? If, yes, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm Mariam. I'm uh, representing Ustic today. Uh, I have this question, um, in what ways might the harmful effects of confirmation bias manifest within the context of developing the Framework Convention on AI and Human Rights, and how can it potentially undermine, it, undermine human rights and democratic principles? Hmm. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Uh, right. Um, maybe I'll take the first one, I don't know, and maybe we can talk about the Huderia process uh, secondly. Uh, sorry, and I think the, the criticism, and I think is unfair, is that the deal struck was uh, a bad one. Um, principally the two areas that were, the scope was probably the most seriously negotiated and, and frankly went down to the wire and, and a, a bit of inside baseball. That was really the hang up right up until the very last uh, few hours of the treaty negotiations. Um, I was not in the room for the final negotiations, which were very, uh, we're almost at that point uh, down to just a few people. But what I can simply say is I think that the treaty itself, uh, in fact, and despite the criticism, effectively binds countries who are signatories to this treaty to regulate and legislate on the public and the private sector. Um, the deal the language is reflective of the likely signatories and, their, and the state of their national legislation and the state of their national debate. Um, I personally would love to have any conversation with anybody in this room if they would like to discuss that further because I think it's an unfair criticism of the process. The other key area, um, and this is somewhat reflective of a, of a different dynamic, was around the inclusion of the national security elements in the treaty. Now, we know, we've heard that the Treaty, uh, the Council of Europe has no mandate in defense, um, but the question around national security being in or out of scope was another area of very intense negotiations. And as I said just a few minutes ago, sometimes getting a treaty is more important than getting the language right, and sometimes you have to start somewhere. And so this criticism of it was an all or nothing, I think what we're what I would respond is that it's a half half a loaf is better than no loaf. 
And so do we recognize that, that over time this treaty could be improved with additional protocols or other processes? Absolutely. But I think what we all recognize is that we needed to get something out the door and that something had to at least be either equally unpleasant or equally pleasant to all potential signatories. Yeah, um, completely agree. And also, I mean, about the implementation and the national implementation, I think we need to make a difference between if we are talking about the uh, 27 member states of the European Union, because uh, they, they don't need to implement this frame of convention because there is implemented or they are going to be implemented by the regulation. So there was not going to be any problem with the private sector. The problem is with the countries outside of the European Union. I mean, the problem is how are they going to implement in the private sector? And then it comes the answer of David. It's better to have this convention than having nothing. And that was what I tried to mean when I get so nervous and I couldn't <laughs> explain myself. It's better to have this um, general agreement on private sector and to trust that all the countries, Canada, United States, Israel, they want to regulate at least the problematic aspect of artificial intelligence than having nothing. And that is the real achievement of this framework convention. But from the 27 European Union member states, we have no problems. That is the relationship. This is the complementary perspective of these two instruments. From the European Union perspective, and that's why we couldn't have uh, this framework convention adopted be before having the regulation, we have no problems in this sector, in the private sector. That's what, what I wanted to, to say before, sorry. I think I think we will discuss that we have no problems part when you talk to the to the countries that have to implement not only the AI Act but the DMA DSA Media Freedom Act, yeah, and uh, it's a little bit of a struggle as, uh, from what I understand. So I wouldn't say we have no problem, <laughs> but maybe you're slightly ahead of others. <laughs> but that's another discussion. Um, <clears throat> Um, to, to, to pick up what, what has been said, I think we could, we could maybe focus a little bit still on the democracy part. Also, the, uh, Wolfgang Benedek's criticism, we have like two, two minutes, minutes left. Mm -hmm. Okay, because talking about human rights is easy, but having a binding convention on democracy and on things like what is false information, what is, what is disinformation, do you really want to have the states being obliged to regulate the media and so on by law when it comes to what is truth or not. I'm, I'm simplifying things, but I think that's a key question that actually we haven't, we still haven't solved. The EU has, has some acts that go in that direction. Many others are discussing in my country it would be impossible to have the state tell the media what is right or wrong because we have a different approach. So I think that is a key thing. So maybe one, uh, one more one minute intervention and one, one minute answer from from you and then we have to stop. <sighs> Thanks, Thomas, really easy one. Um, what I would simply say is, you know, yes, I just wanted to answer the earlier question about positive bias. I mean, separate to the treaty is another much longer process that's called the Huderia, so human rights, democracy, rule of law, impact assessment, and so there is an actual quite a long term being run by the Alan Turing Institute to try to flesh out what would be a generic risk framework that countries could use. And I think some of these questions around how to address bias um, uh, is being looked at. And so Canada uh, is part of this process. We've come with a case study, in fact, that uses our immigration department, which uses a, a substantive number of AI systems. Um, and I'm sure other countries uh, similarly have other case studies. Um, but to your point, so we have a number of pieces of legislation, and, and all of these touch on aspects of the treaty. Um, but fundamentally, and I think this is just a general takeaway comment, is that we, we really understood well human rights in the context of this con uh, uh, council treaty negotiation. Uh, things kind of fell off fairly quickly when we started to think about what, what, what are the rights, uh, dem what is a dem you know, upholding democracy? Is that parliament? Is that you know offices of privacy? So and then rule of law. And so there was sort of this open-ended question that is still sort of I think being ruminated on is what does a legally binding treaty mean for upholding democracy and rule of law when there really isn't a lot of case study or perhaps common understanding? And so we effectively had to go down to basic principles. 
Okay, 10 seconds, sure, sure. Um, I mean, we, maybe we don't, we don't need to regulate media, but we need to bear in mind that artificial intelligence is there, and what we do need is to assure that people can freely form opinions. And for that, we can use legally binding general principles, and judges or other legal operators can apply them case by case, because regulating is very complex. But knowing in a certain case that that is a misinformation, that is a defect, is easier than to regulate from a general perspective. Thank you. So to summarize, we have now a few things achieved on paper. We have a convention, which is general, but there are some principles, there are some, there are some obligations in the what, with uh, quite an option in the how, but the what is clear. We do have an AI Act and a num number of other things that may also influence uh, countries from outside the EU, but these things now exist on paper. Now we need to make all of this work, and that is at least as complex as developing the papers. I think we agree on this, and I also would say we agree on, we are still at the beginning of developing the uh, normative system around how to deal with AI, but at least we have started, I think that's the main point. Thank you very much, thank you all for, for joining. Um, thank you, Thomas. Enjoy thank the next day. Thank you, Thomas and the company. I just imagine what would be if you here would be like plus two people, yeah. two more people, so there would be no time for you all, you know, because now you use all the time and even more. This is adaptive uh, governance <laughs> of a session, so <laughs> but when things change, you adapt, that's it. But I like how <laughs> flexible you are and you adapt. Yeah, and guys, talking again back about that link, yeah, please. We are getting closer to 100, as I asked you, but please do your best, because we put some effort to have all the things you see, so please put some efforts to leave a review. And see you at 12.30 here again back, okay? <laughs>